Hello, and a very warm welcome to the Journey Journals. My name is Gaia at Life of Gaia, and today we will be covering an absolutely fascinating topic, which is how to prepare for an ayahuasca journey. And today I have the honor and the privilege of a very special guest with me who also happens to be a dear friend who I've known for many, many years and who has a fascinating background. Her name is Tatiana Marx, and she also goes by the name Aya Shakti, which she'll explain a little bit later. Now, the incredible thing about Tatiana is that she is a plant medicine woman and a plant medicine guide who has held retreats all over the world, specifically related to plant medicine. A warm welcome to you, Tatiana. Thank you, Gaia. I'm so happy to be uh, sharing this time with you. And what a, a blessing to have such a platform to talk about such important things as this one. <laughs> Likewise, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, as you well know. So Tatiana, I'd like you to start off, if you could explain to our audience a little bit about your background, because I find your background and your journey is fascinating. And I know we're going to do another interview around that, and I'm very excited for it. But I'd love to hear more about your practices, your work, your training and your background. I was born in a jungle uh, in Brazil, in the northeast of Brazil, in the state called Bahia. My, my parents, my mother is indigenous from the Tupinambá origin in Brazil. My father not. My father is just a regular uh, Brazilian. And they met really young in their life. And my mother was uh, 12 years old when she got with my father. My father was also young. He was uh, 15 years old. I was born in a, in a jungle from these two pa parents, but I was, didn't grow up with them. Somehow the, their life was really hard. My father died, someone killed him actually, when I was three years old. And this making my the whole family moved and I got separate from my mother because my mother was not to go to the city, for example. She wanted to stay in the jungle setting. So we go to the jungle when I am 10 years old. And it was there when actually the, the toughest part of my life started. Until 10 years old, I was in the jungle and it was one of my favorite time of, in my life was to be free in such a way in the jungle. And to be a child and, and feel this sense of freedom for me was actually what saved me out of the bad things that was happening. There was a lot of traumas happening in this family, physical trauma, sexual traumas, uh, psychological traumas, all levels of trauma, violence, people killing each other, abusing each other sexually. And it was not different for, my, for me and also for the other children that was in the house. So growing throughout all of this uh, density, all this trauma in the inside of the family, took me uh, at the point of 14 years old to leave the house. I don't know what I'm going to do at this point of my life. I just know that I cannot take any more suffering, any more pain into myself. I will rather be on the street, maybe even die, because I didn't know what is going to happen to me. I will rather that happen to me than continue to suffer the way that I was suffering in such a young age. So I decided to leave and then from this 14 years old until I was 19, I, I lived a, a great uh, part of my life into sex, drugs, and rock and roll because I had such a pain inside of my heart and I, I understood it and I believed at that point that life it was all about that. Life was all about suffering. Life was all about uh, struggling. Life was all about pain. And I didn't want it, my life. I didn't want to, I imagine this young as I was, I was imagining that I cannot grow older. I needed to die while I'm younger because I cannot take this overwhelm of uh, suffering of life. So I am going to do uh, things to take me closer to death. So I will do, I will go to, uh, uh, difficult, dangerous, the most dangerous things to do that my friends will ask me to go with them, I will do that, you know, drink, be, be very uh, uh, drugged, not remember anything, go into uh, uh, car races and go into jumping into things and things dangerous to really risk, it. maybe it's the adrenaline, maybe it's the inconsequence of a young age, you know, and 
this emptiness inside of me, I believe it was what drove me to do all of those dangerous things because I, I thought I don't have the courage to take my own life, but if I put myself in danger enough, life is going to take care of it. So I did that and I did that for, for this period of time. Anyway, for 19, I met uh, the first man that I fall in love. And that uh, changed, changed the, the, the stage that I was in my mind and in my heart that I want to die now and changed to, wow, maybe there is something else into life. I never loved nobody. I never felt loved by nobody, even from my family. And now I found this person that I can feel a glimpse of love. I can feel a glimpse of caring for someone and I can feel the glimpse of someone caring for me. Maybe I, I may, maybe I deserve because I didn't, I didn't want to believe that I deserve because of the hard experience that I was having. The core belief inside of me was that I didn't deserve life. I didn't deserve it to be loved. I didn't deserve anything that was good. So then meeting this person brought that feeling that maybe I deserve a little bit of the goodness too. No? So it inspired me to continue. I inspired also me to stop my bad behavior, right? The dangerous behavior that I was having. It inspired me to do less of the drugs that I was doing, experimenting of all type of drugs, also in the tentative to take away my life, you know? So with this love, the love it grew. With this person, the relationship it grew. The love it grew, and I uh, I start to have a different experience of life. Like maybe with love, maybe if we open our heart, maybe there are more into life than only suffering and pain. No, uh, so so little I knew at the time. <laughs> so little I knew at the time because this was the greater portal. Falling in love with someone, creating a life together, and, and navigating to those deep places, you know, with the pain and the suffering. Now having hope, having inspiration into a new, different experience of this life. It was a great. Uh, portal for me being created this portal was very important because it was the very portal that brought love and inspiration and happiness in this phase of my life it was the very portal that will take me back into the very core inside of my myself right the relationship it lasted the time that I had to last the relationship it lasted to the time I believe it today uh, the time that I needed the support of that relationship. And then when I was ready to fly with my wings because I needed to have that experience as well, the relationship it was closed. When the relationship is closed, I go to the bottle of the bottle of my pain. Now I have to revisit and I have to revisit everything double, right? Because then it was the suffering from since the birth and then uh, reviving, living all the suffering and struggle by, as a teenager on the streets, and now heartbroken because it, it, it was not the dream, it was not what I imagined it to be. So then this portal that took me back into the original pain in my core was actually the, 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 the space that I got to save myself, right? Most of us are very afraid, feel pain into struggle. As if not all of us, you know, human beings are afraid of that. But we forget, or maybe we don't even uh, know or learn that it's through those portals that we're going to find resolution. It's through those portals that we're going to find liberation. Through those portals, I find myself. I went back into the original pain of being separated from my family, of not having nobody that loved me through the broken heart of the relationship that was so important to me. And then when I go back into that place, those places inside of myself, now I truly want to die and I wanted to do something that I, in my, my own power, to do that. No? I went to New York, I did the, the drugs again, because it's stronger now, because I already had it before, but now I am a old, little older. So I can do it stronger now and more courage to go into the dark. I'm going to go to the dark and what the dark may take me, you know? So, <laughs> and I did that. And while I was having that experience, more intentionally in going to the dark and to the pain inside of myself, uh, medicine find, found me. Medicine came into my life right then. <laughs> Tatiana, could you explain for the people who don't know what you refer to when you say medicine? Yes, of course. I work with a plant medicine that we call that is called ayahuasca. 
These medicines call many names, depending on the court culture that you are, the culture that you learn the medicine from, it has a name, no? depending on the language that you are learning this. Each, each community to tribe has its own name and its way to work with the medicine as well. So I, uh, the medicine that came to me at that moment was ayahuasca. Ayahuasca came from the north of Brazil, interesting enough, because I was born in the north of Brazil. My uh, forebears worked with ayahuasca, but I never ever knew about the, the existence of this plant. And when I was in the bottom of my, but exist of my pain and suffering in this incarnation, this medicine show up. I had a good friend that was studying with me at the time, the time I was studying in New York and preparing myself to disincarnate because I was so depressed in such a deep level that I felt that there is no art more for me. I don't want anything more. I wanted this to be over and period. So this dear friend um, went to Brazil because she's also Brazilian and she uh, went to a ceremony of ayahuasca. She had a, oh, her process. It was very deep for herself too. And she go back to the state where I was at the time and she say, I know that you wanted to die. I know you don't want anything with life, but before you do that, like your final decision that you're not going to participate in life and you're going to give yourself to death, drink this medicine. Because I drink it and I remember this. I remember she was adopted. She was adopted by an American family and she remember everything about her biological, biological family that she didn't know anything about it since the childhood. So she, she told me her experience and it was so touching to see someone having such experience you know, in, in just one session. And she, it was like going to church, basically, you know, and coming out and being so liberated and free from so many uh, pain and suffering. So she told me her story. I saw how emotional she became. And I also saw the result because she went there. She was in one state. When she came back, she was in a very different state. So I was very curious. I was like, hey, let's drink it right now. <laughs> I thought it was like just a normal tea because I didn't know anything about psychedelic or medicine anything about the practice and she say no you cannot do it like that you you cannot actually die if you do that if you, but we, the intention is not for us to die you need to remember things so you, you stop feeling the way that you are feeling no? so we she tell me what to do she tell me that i had to prepare my body do some fasting and stop drinking because i used to drink every single day to become you know forget everything forget what was hurting so I, I agree. I say I will do that for a period of time and we're going to drink it. And at the time I was living in a studio in, in New York, in Manhattan, and she had the same situation about the, her living as well. So and she, it was just one session of the ceremony that she did in Brazil. And basically, we don't know absolutely nothing and what we have to do to do a, a session of ayahuasca. No? But she was so touched by my process that she say we're going to do it together. I will give it to you, the medicine, and we will sit together. We will be there and watch what is going to happen. And then we will be, you now she will hold the space for me. So she, we did that. And I was not feeling the first round, you know, the first cup of medicine. And I told her that I will need more. I ended up drinking three times, you know, the cup. is a small cup that we drink of medicine. So I ended up drinking three times. And that was a journey of 12 hours. And those 12 hours is one of the most important 12 hours of my life, other than the 12 the hours that I was born into this world, you know, to have this experience. That moment of the experience of 12 hours was the moment that when I died and I uh, uh, came into life again, came into life again. The old self had completely died. It was very scary, uh, but a new self, it was reborn with uh, initiation of something. <laughs> Tatiana, it's so interesting to hear you say that because I, I feel like I had a similar experience and, you know, um, ayahuasca and other plant medicines are becoming more and more popular these days. And, you know, it, it seems like a very, very large percentage of people who experience these medicines um, report back that it is, you know, sometimes the most significant moment of their life outside of you know, the birth of a child or anything like that. It, it certainly was for me too. So I would love mm -hmm. it if you could take a moment to just explain to people, maybe for those who don't know, what an ayahuasca ceremony actually is and its potential for personal growth and for healing especially. 
Mm -hmm. Ayahuasca ceremony is one of my favorite practice to do in this world. For me, it literally resembles like going to church for the version of something divine. No? Church was created, I believe, for this purpose. So we can go to a place, a sacred place, so we can devote ourselves, devote our heart, devote our prayers, our thoughts into something bigger than us, into divine itself. You know, is a, a connection, a recognition that we are part of that divine ourselves as well. So ceremony, uh, ayahuasca ceremonies is exactly that. We're going to sit in a group, in a community, in a circle. We're going to be together and we're going to pray together, literally, you know, through the sounds that comes because we learn specific prayers, music. We call them Icarus. No? We, we, we learn in them specifically to prayer in a specific way so we can get in contact with something bigger than us. The plants have intelligence, like it, not only ayahuasca, but all the all the planet, plants of this planet has intelligence. The same way that we eat a carrot and the carrot can nurture our body with its nutrients, all the living things, plants or not plants, are also doing the same thing for us, not for this very body, for this very mind of, of, of ours. So I ask a ceremony is that. It's like going to church, but now we're going to drink a sacrament so we can steal our body. We can still make it steal our mind. So we can navigate and see what is inside in the depth of ourselves. We go so many times throughout our whole life. We don't know anything about what we're being created inside of this very self here. We don't know the state of inside of our hearts. We don't know the state inside of our very mind. We just go by the automatic emotion of the everyday today life. And we are busy and we have everything, so many things to take care of in our everyday life that we do not pay attention to what the state that is inside of our very self. And when that happens, things get difficult, things get hard because we accumulate, we accumulate so much. We accumulate the pain, we accumulate the suffering. Yes, we accumulate a little, a little bit of the love and the cherish too of life. But most of the things that we accumulate is the thing that we don't want to deal with. We hide them. We hide it if you feel if you feel bad, we hide it if you feel sad, we hide it things that we don't want it to show to the society or to the to the people around us because we didn't learn in that. We didn't learn in that the hiding things inside, not going inside of ourselves is going to make us sick. We didn't learn in that. Nowhere in the society told us that we need to take care of our state inside so we can be healthy in the outside. So when we drink ayahuasca, we learn in that. That is one of the first things that comes, no? because medicine is going to take us inside. What is it that we are cultivating inside of our minds? What is the nature of our thoughts? What is the nature of the, the feelings that is coming to us? What is that we are feeding inside of us? And what is that is becoming us no? through the words, through our gesture, to all the things that we do into, into our life? So we learn about that. We also learn where inside of us is sick and what is the reason that we are sick. Because of the accumulation of those things, inevitably, the body is going to get sick. Is inevitably. They say, the elders say that when the body expresses sickness, the spirit is already screaming. So in a way, the spirit starts to scream because we are not paying attention, we are not hearing. We are not hearing that all of this inside is making us sick or having a poor uh, uh, a quality of life. So medicine shows us if you, the body is sick, the medicine is going to navigate that first and foremost to, to show the individual what is the reason of sickness, why is the body is screaming in the first place, and what is one can do about this. What can I do to be healthy? What can I do to bring a, a, a clear, a higher state of, in, of mind, of conscious inside of myself? I have the power for that, no? If I only learn in soul medicine, we go to ceremony so we can learn in those abilities. Those abilities is no ability that is outside of ourselves. It's all inside of ourselves. All the abilities, all the things, all there. But we don't have access or we don't learn how to have access into those things. So we are oblivious into life and we go and we go into the suffering and the pain without doing much different in there. When we bring psychedelic to the picture, not only ayahuasca, but all the majority, the majority of psychedelic that is out there uh, today's day, we, we accelerate the process of someone so much, so much the acceleration of this understanding, of this learning, no? Even someone suffering with PTSD or, or, or very severe depression, 
like a severe that I have been encountering and have sessions of psychedelics and going so far in the, in the process, you know, like literally day to night feeling a new person. So there are great significance and importance into the psychedelic. And thank God that it is happening in these days because we need it so much. I, I believe in one of the most needed times, you know, in the time of a humankind, we need it more now. There are a lot of technology that is coming in and fasting pace to the life and fasting pace to all the things, the ways that we think and that uh, make it even easier for us to restore and, and, and guard ourselves inside in a way to be safe, you know, we wanted to be safe ultimately in life. But let's not forget that we are not only matter, we also spirit and the spirit has a saying to all of this. And then there, there is medicine for us to drink and practice and recognize those things. Such a transformational experience and you've just gone through a lot of the different considerations to look at before deciding to do it. And, you know, we wanted to take this interview to talk about preparation in particular and highlight that and I wanted to ask you what do you what do you have to say to someone who's thinking about doing an ayahuasca ceremony for the first time you know or deciding to do it what should they consider mm -hmm. one of the first things to consider if is a condition of the body now if it, the person has some types of specific conditions they are uh, contradictory with the medicine for example, if someone suffers of a, a heart uh, problem, heart disease, any heart problem is, is to be paying attention to when you go into psychedelic as in general. Ayahuasca has a tendency to accelerate our heart, no? because we are navigating into depth of ourselves, bring memories from this, the very beginning of our life, if, sometimes even from before. Those things can be strong and overwhelming for the heart, right? So if someone has a, a heart problem, it is indicated that this person do not drink ayahuasca, for example, but I find a different way with, to work with the plant. Someone could do micro, micro dose, for example, a drop or two to work with the medicine that way and be safe. Other, another condition is also uh, psychological. If someone have a uh, schizophrenic, for example, no cl clinic, clinical uh, uh, schizophrenic, uh, this person is also indicated not to drink medicine because the medicine, again, is going to make the mind to navigate into depth that maybe the person that has this condition is not going to serve this person so well. So those things are very serious and important to consider before you know that you can drink medicine. Even if you do not suffer from those things, then everybody that can, then don't have those conditions is, is okay to drink medicine, right? We The plants are natural, like all the plants is in this planet. I feel... I feel in the planet, we have medicine and we have a poison, but it's the same plant. The poison is only poison because we didn't learn the amount of the plant to intake, right? It becomes poison. In the jungle, it's the same way. The very poison plant is going to be a healing for something else. But if you don't learn the amount of this plant, then some, some people die, no? naturally. So we learn about that. We learn about how to use medicine. Uh, responsible and we want we learn also to take a responsibility and to learn what is it possible for us and not you know the majority of the way everything is possible it's not I don't encounter so many people that comes to me with conditions like that I encounter a lot more with a deep depression PTSD you know the, the trauma uh, after going to war or something as traumatic things like that and in that in those cases it can be so so beneficial so if you consider drinking medicine you consider those things first and then the second most important thing to consider is who are you going to drink with medicine no? who is the person that you're going to how is it they're going to find this medicine where is this medicine come from it's same the same origin no? um to know the person that is going to bring the medicine is very important. They is going to literally give the medicine to you. No? What is the intentionality of this person bringing the medicine? What is the practice of the life of this person bringing the medicine? There is so much medicine being shared around the world. 
And I believe in the end, it's, it's all positive, you know, but we, we need to be more responsible. We need to be more responsible for the practice that we, we invite and also for the people that come to, to drink medicine. And also as, as individual participants on ceremony, we also have to, to gain learning and responsibility because I can go just because I was invited to a ceremony and I can go blindly. Yes, my good friend invited me and I don't know anything about it, but I can now know, wait a minute, let me learn what is what is this medicine, where it's coming from, who is this person that is bringing. I can learn, I can take time to learn that and feel more secure inside of me. You, When you, you learn about the medicine, you feel the call to drink the medicine, that is a really good sign because some of us learn about the medicine and have a reversion about it. Oh my God, I don't want to do that. But if you feel like an invitation, if you feel a call to it, you're probably going to gain a lot, a lot of understanding, a lot of uh, consciousness is going to come out of this practice. No? So there is a first sign that if, if you feel that way. And then you learn about those details. You learn about the person, you learn about your own conditions, and then you go to, to a ceremony. Learning, uh, uh, doing the, the practice we call uh, diet pre-ceremony, pre pre-ceremony, pre no? we call them diets, special diets. So very important to emphasize this here, the diets before the, the medicine. Now we're going to talk a little bit more later on. But do the preparation, prepare your body so you can, do, you can go to this experience and trust your heart. Thank you. So, you know, you, you've you've done a great job of discussing, you know, how to find the right practitioner to pay attention to your mental, your physical state and all of that. And I wanted to speak to you about actual preparation before the ceremony, because I, from a personal experience, I've experienced the difference between good and bad preparation, and it was significant but I wanted to hear your opinion on what difference does preparing versus not preparing create and, and how to prepare well. Yes. <laughs> the difference is day and night, day and night, literally. Imagine it like I gave you. <laughs> Imagine you going to run a marathon, right? You have to prepare your body to run a marathon. Otherwise, you're not going to uh, pass the, the next two or the next hour or the next two hours, no? And when you prepare for a marathon, imagine you going to eat barbecue the whole day, the whole night, and you're going to drink alcohol and you do all those things normal. You're not, you didn't do anything actually to prepare your body. You just did normal. There is going to be a problem in your marathon. Maybe you're going to run for... 10 minutes or maybe an hour, you know, depending on, on the state of your, your physicality, but it's not going to be a good experience. It's similar to medicine work as well. No, when we prepare, our, when we receive the calling and we know that we're going to go to partake in a ceremony, we're going to equally prepare our body because it's a very serious thing. It's serious, it's a, it's serious in the level of the spirit, it's serious in the level of your very healthy, your very, your body all the cells is going to be working into the into this process right so if we do not prepare our bodies it's going to be as strong as if we didn't prepare for the marathon we're going to be purging crying but so much more to clean all the things that is in a way for us to have experience so i say if you cannot follow the the guidelines for preparation wait a little more wait until you can follow the, the guidelines because i had experience with people coming without following the guidelines and they struggle so much and it's a it's a, it's a pain you know to watch someone struggle so much just to clear out the things that could be avoided could they be avoided so i say wait if you don't if you cannot follow the guidelines to prepare your body in the way and it, when you feel that you this is what you need right now it's going to be so much easier for you to prepare your body because it's not a bigger deal neither, not to prepare our body to do something so deep, importantly, to our life and to our health, to our spiritual growth as well. So in this preparation, what we're going to uh, uh, do is first is with the food that we intake, right? The food that we intake, it can be uh, of dense energy and it can be of light energy, right? If we, if we eat a salad, our body can process and feel light versus if we eat a piece of red meat, right? So we do, we ask it, uh, the time of a one week period for us to be paying attention into what we're going to eat. We're going to avoid some foods too, like uh, uh, red meat. We're going to... Uh, 
ask the participant not to read the red meat. Why we know it's red meat? Because the red meat, as we all know, is a dance, is a flash, right? And it's going to stay inside of the body for such a long time. There is one phase, one part of the red meat not, not to drink it, not to eat it. When we eat red meat, some of us, if we are not healthy and, and, and exercising and, and athletic, the red meat can stay inside of the gut for a month. So what is it, this, this material inside of the body going to be in a way, what is this effect is going to be when you are drinking something that is so strong that needs all the space inside of your body? You're going to struggle and it can be painful. This struggle is, can be very painful. Nobody want to go through this uncomfortable situation. So we take a break from red meat. If you are a red meat eater, we're going to not eat red meat for the whole week. What can I do then? Well, maybe if you cannot live without the meat, if you cannot have a vegetarian or even vegan diet for, for one week, you choose the things that are most light. You can eat a piece of fish, maybe. You can eat eggs, maybe. You can do things like that. They are not so dense as red meat. The same thing goes for dairy. Dairy creates so much inflammation inside of our body, and we don't need those, those things inside of our body when we are drinking medicine because we're going to be struggling just to take the inflammation out of the body. Nothing else. We're not going to go no, no up and down. We're going just to be struggling to take the dairy. Why would you do this experience? Just don't eat dairy for one week, and you're going to have such a much amazing experience with the medicine. The same thing goes for alcohol as well. No? First, I want to go back with the meat. The first level of the meat is the dance of the flesh and it's staying inside of our body for such a long time. The second part is also the emotions that goes with this meat. No? We know in this country and most of it everywhere in the world, the animal is struggling and in pain for dying to become the meat that we're going to eat in the end. So where do we think that this pain, this amount of emotion is gonna go bloof in the air? No, it's not. It's going to be right there in the flesh of the piece of meat that we are consuming. And we consume that. And that emotion, that a charge, a bomb of emotion, it distorts it, painful emotion, is gonna go through our physical and our life bodies so we can process it for that dead animal. We also don't need that in our in our in our process. We already have to do deal with so much <laughs> of ourselves that we don't need that. So we want to avoid that. So we avoid the alcohol, the same thing. With alcohol, we open up the doors for so many uh, influences into the invisible. They stick in, into our field. We have no idea of this, you know. So, what, again, we don't need to bring this, this to, to our ceremonies as well. One week can be like an alternative for someone. They are so addicted to their behaviors, they cannot stop it. But if they only do that, or if they only did it, just the diet without drinking the medicine, they will already feel amazing, different than before they did it. And if they drink medicine in, the period, in that period, oh my God, life transformation, 100%, you know. So preparation is very important. The other part of the preparation, other than the diet, is what we're going to avoid mentally, what we're going to avoid energetically, right? Some of us have a work or, or friend or even family environment. They're very disturbing. They're very noisy. They are very loud, you know? And this is going to affect our field. And we're going to be this carry this charge with us. No, there is not seen, but it's there, it's in us. We're going to carry this charge into the ceremony. Our ceremony is going to be all about clear, clearing those, those charges no? that doesn't belong into our field. So the ceremony is going to be about that. So not to avoid that, we're going to do things like being, being in si silence during this, this week. We're going to choose to do things by nature. Go walk at the barefoot, you know, as if not every day, at least a few of those days of the week, you go and you expose your body into the natural, the natural world. Drink more water, even if you don't have anywhere to go, like a little park, drink more water. Pray with this water because it's going to bring you closer to nature and closer to the elements as well. No? Uh, avoid to watch the TV, but the, I don't know even the expression, but please avoid to watch the TV. If it's not only in these seven days, if you can create even more space not to watch the TV, 
is going to be so much more beneficial for your health because all the information that comes to TV, it doesn't matter if the TV is for information that we are watching or if it's for entertaining. All the energy that comes to our field is storage, is inevitable, is energy, encountering energy. It's inevitable that we're going to have that into our field and we're going to carry it. We're going to carry that not only to our health inside our flat show of our cells, but we're going to mentally and emotionally as well. And when we, there are some people that don't live without entertainment, TV and, and social media. When those type of people come to session, the ceremony is basically to clear all of those energy out. So they understand, oh my God, I've been so distorted believing in all these things that I'm being exposed to. So I also ask and, and incentivate people to do that and do in that way you can detox you know in this week of the first layer of the things that cloud that cloud our mind the cloud our feelings the cloud our bodies we can take at least the first layer so we can get into the the ceremony with more more chances no to get into where we want, wanted to get this to the core of ourselves to the core of uh, the process that is going on inside very interesting. So we've covered, you know, how people should prepare from a dietary perspective, how they should prepare from a physical um, perspective, from a mental perspective. How about emotionally? How should a person come into a journey from an emotional standpoint? And what sort of mindset is helpful when you're coming into your first journey? Mm -hmm. Very good uh, question, important question too. I will do my best to answer. Uh, I'm going to use myself, you know, when I am emotionally um, overwhelmed, when I feel agitated and, and even sometimes upset, you know, mad about whatever it is that life, life is bringing to me. The first practice that I uh, like to introduce into my own life and suggest is that Coming out of the negative state of mind is what is a crucial thing to do, you know? Because imagine if I have a problem and I'm going to be every single day or even all day long thinking about that problem, thinking about that, I am heartbroken and I'm gonna be all day long thinking about my heart broken and how heartbroken I am and how life it is unfair because my heart is broken, you know, is to come out of this state. It's not easy. It's not the easiest thing to do because of the, we don't. Nobody wanted to feel with heartbroken. Nobody wanted to feel the overwhelmment of life or the madness that is going around. Not that we take it personal most of the time. So for me, I will do things that will take me out of this state. You know? The state is not going to go away. The state is going to be there. But I'm going to do things in my life to take me out. I am heartbroken. And nothing in, in my environment is, is going to make the, my heart not being broken. But I know if I go to plant some, something in my garden, I will feel a little better. I know if I, put a, if I go swim, I'm going to feel a little better. I know if I stay in the sun and I eat the thing, my favorite thing to eat, I'm going to feel a little better. So I will do things like that to support me into what I get into the ceremony, right? Because when we, want, when we get to the ceremony and we drink the medicine, then the work is even deeper, no? That is happening. So then all that I need to do is carry myself, but also not only when we are preparing ourselves to drink medicine, in our life as well. Because when we stay in the mindset of the problem on that level of the heartbreak, of the pain, of the struggle, we're going to create more of this. It's inevitable. We are feeding energy into it. It's going to grow. Every time we think about my heart is broken, my heart is gonna be broken longer because I gave you I gave you energy for that to be so. But if I I understand and I know my heart is broken, I can do something else opposite to make me feel opposite of my heart is broken, and suddenly my heart is going to start uh, uh, be, come back into balance because nobody's heart is gonna be broken forever. A heart get broken so we can learn from the, this broken heart, right? And the deeper, deeper, deeper lessons can come from a broken heart. I'm just using the broken heart here as an example, no? But so much uh, blessing, so much gift, so much preciousities can come out of it. any struggle, any pain, and any heart broken. If we can only see, if we can only come out of the state that is actually the struggle state, we can see. Yes, we are marvelous. We are divine beings. It's sparkle here, walking in the flesh. We are able to do 
all that we put our mind into it. We can do all that we put our heart and energy into it. So my way of coming out and dealing with my emotions when I am not 100% is to do everything, little or big, practice in my everyday life that is going to bring joy feeling, that's going to be happy feeling to me, simple like just exposing myself into the sun, just drinking the, the tea that I love, just, to, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd, I'd love to address another piece of the emotions to it, which, which I have to say um, was a challenge for me initially. And I'd love to address the part of surrender versus control when you first go into a ceremony, because at times, you know, it can be incredibly beautiful, but it can also be incredibly confronting and challenging. And, you know, sometimes as much as you want to surrender and roll with it, it's it's not always that easy. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, surrender versus control and how to actually prepare yourself as much as you can mm -hmm. um, to go into a journey with that mindset. Yes. Thank you for the question too. Um, yes. You know, in general, human being has the control uh, mechanism up. We need, we have the survival things going on. Some of us more than others, no? Some of us are more relaxed into taking risks into life and some of the majority, not really. That is normal because the state of the life is since we were born into the, today, if we didn't have those mechanisms, God knows what would be of us. <laughs> but at the same time, we have to understand that those are not the only options. There are so much many options that we can use. No? When we come to drink medicine, inevitably we're going to have the control up because we're going to go to a place that are not comfortable because we sometimes don't understand where is the message going to take us, you know, inside of ourselves. We don't know where, what we're going to visit. So their control, are, are, the control system are up. And that's okay. Just accept what is there. Accept whatever state it is inside of you. Don't try to change anything. Don't try to, oh my God, I'm so controlled. I don't need to be like this. Oh my God, I'm so surrendered. No, don't think absolutely nothing about that. Just watch it. Watch the state that is there. Recognize what, what is there. And, oh, oh my God, I feel so controlling about these things. Just recognize that. And that's it. What All that you need to do is to be, uh, create the environment inside of you that you are safe. It's okay if you are have the controls up. It's okay if you are more uh, surrendering. That's okay. When you want to go and sit and drink the medicine, the mess is going to work with you and it's going to show you. It's going to show you, oh, you are, your system is up like this, your system is up like that. And I, I feel in my process with the medicine that is so intelligent. It, it gets us right where we need. And then we, we learn it right away in this glimpse of moment. Okay, I need to relax. Okay, I need to surrender. And what is the best way for you to understand from inside out what you got to do, you know, for you to work with the system up or down, middle way or not. You are the master here. You are the master of your experience. You are the master of the universe that is being held here. So just accept it. Accept it. Don't make a big deal of, out of you. Oh, my God, I'm so controlled. I cannot do this. Just if you, you can do anything, drop it. Drop it. Let it be what it is. Don't think about it. Take your mind out of it and trust this process. I promise you, if you, if you trust the process, you're going to find the surrender, the right surrender, the right uh, uh, feelings for you to feel and embody right then when you're having the experience. Now, I, I am absolutely curious about something because our, I believe uh, the almost the 10 year anniversary of our friendship and of us knowing each other has, is coming up soon in a year or so. And I have to say, you are by far one of the bravest people I know. Mm -hmm. And the reason is this, is that when I first met you, you were living a completely different life um, in a completely different place um, with completely different priorities. And, you know, this is this is a story that we'll go into detail more in a different interview because your your journey is fascinating, but it's filled with bravery and you pretty much picked up and left and went to go and do training for a very long period of time, very deeply into the Amazon jungle. 
I would love to know how you prepared when you were there and what you learned there. Mm-hmm. What a, wow. <laughs> also, it's like one of, one of uh, uh, my favorite parts of the story is this part when I feel this strong call in my heart that I had to give up everything and go to the jungle. After having that experience, the first experience of, with the medicine, you know, I was in New York at the time, in my experience with the medicine, I saw many things. One, one of the most important things that I saw was the face of my mother. Because throughout my whole life until that point, I didn't remember her face and I did not remember her love. I didn't remember the connection that I had at one time in my life with my mother. Right? And I, I didn't have that in my system. So the medicine showed me that. And when the medicine showed me that, it somehow took me to my roots took me to the origin, you know, the origin of where I came from. And in that line of uh, understanding where I came from, it showed me that where I came from was the jungle. I came from the, the depth in the jungle. And I forgot, I forgot to those depths of the jungle. And then I have to go back to those depths, to those places in the jungle so I can find myself, my true nature, because I was so... Uh, covered with all the illusions that made it Tatiana to be at the time what Tatiana was and uh, the medicine showed me it has nothing to do with Tatiana all that that you think is Tatiana has nothing to do with what Tatiana is so then I followed that threat I followed that threat to go to the jungle because I needed to reconnect with my true nature I need to reconnect with my roots you know and I didn't have no idea where because my life took so many different turns and I don't know. I had like my, the family of my father so big, I don't know half of them. My mother disappeared from my life when I was three years old. Not disappeared, no, my, the family moved it away and she disappeared from my life when I was three years old until the moment. So I have no idea where to go in the jungle. But I also uh, read a lot and I like to be informed and I learn about it the movement of going to Peru, a lot of people going to Peru for learning about the mess or drinking medicine or the centers there. And I felt called to go to Peru. Brazil have the same amount of medicine and all equally like Peru is part of our culture also. The medicine have a, a church of itself called Ayahuasca, Union do Vegetal is also institutions not that serve the medicine. They're very serious and they are very old also. No? For we, many years they are doing their work. And because I grew up in a Christian setting, I grew up until I, was, until I came out of the house of my grandmother, I was 14 years old, since birth, I only know the church and the, the, all the doctrine of a, a Christian church, a Pentecostal church, a very serious church, you know, and because of this set, mindset that I had, and I am, when I come out of that, I didn't feel called to learn it in Brazil at the time. I didn't feel called because all the practices, you know, I cannot say all, but the majority of the practice in Brazil has the concept of the church inside of them. Uh, and I didn't want anything with the church. So I decided to go to Peru. I went to Peru and I spent about like eight months just to try to find someone, right? <laughs> and I didn't know absolutely nothing. So I spent a lot of, a lot of people say to, to don't go to Peru with a woman. There are bad things that happen with women there. And I had all that going on too. But I was, I wanted to find the jungle that I can learn. And I want to find like a, a, a teacher, you know, that can show me things because I have no idea what, what is this. And I know that I have to learn more. So in these eight months, a lot of things happened, very important things also. A lot of abuse, you know. I already came from abuse inside of my own family. Big, deep, traumatic abuse, sexual abuse with one another, incest and all of that. Now the person in, in, in power, the person that is bringing the message to me and say, I am the, the teacher, I am the shaman, right? I am the shaman. And then say, you have to take your clothes off for, for me to do work on you. You have to lay with me so I can do work with you. So is there kind of like a repetition of a, a little bit the things that were going on in the time of trauma, the sexual trauma? And I was very close and I was closing myself even more. And if it was not sexual, it was money-wise. But I, because I had the experience of trauma in a young age, I could recognize and I could also take myself out of the situation because I was not a little girl anymore. I can see it by like very far if someone have a bad intention, 
in those areas because I, I, I grew up inside of, of an environment like that. So I will find a way to stop and not, not and close the, the, the relationship. In the end, I spend all my money. In the end, I don't, I already have lost even my hope because all these things happening, I say like, who wanted to do this? Who wanted to learn? No, maybe that's why people in general in the society don't know about this practice because it's so obscure and it's scary, you know? And then in the end of this eight month, I was ready to leave Peru because I didn't have more money and didn't have more space also in my mind to, to continue to do it. And then someone uh, from Mexico at the time that I knew a woman say, if, asking me if I have, if a lot of people knew that I was looking for teachers. Asking me if I knew about someone called Juan Flores. I never, never heard about Juan Flores. Then I started looking for Juan Flores, finally found him and started learning with the Juan Flores. And I learned with Juan Flores until this day, but I have learned so many things about that. Going to the jungle, when I decided that I'm going to go to the jungle, was a, a, a calling, a, a deep call of my own spirit to, to find myself. I have created a person, a personality, an individual. I have created a life that was not my true self. I was not, never was learning or never knew how to connect to my true nature. And the calling to go to the jungle was this calling deep inside of me that I need to find my true nature. And in order to find my true nature, I need, I, I need it. My need it, you know, is individual. This, this, this thing, the calling is all individual. It's particular for each uh, experience of each person. But my need at the time was to give up all that I knew. Oh, everything, absolutely everything, even clothes, everything, everything, and go to the junk without owning anything. You just go and find a new life with it. Just this pair of clothes that you have, go. And then that was what I did. It was necessary for me at the moment. Huh? And it grew up, and this grew up, and I understood why I had to go there, why I had to, to give up all the reference that I knew until now so I can find the true self that I was looking for. So I did that. And that was a great struggle. One of my favorite parts too of the story because of the struggle that I had to go through in the beginning before finding the teacher. And then after finding the teacher, the teacher didn't tell me anything. He say, oh, good, you were here to drink medicine. Great, let's go. Let's go to the jungle. <laughs> and we go to the jungle. And it's, we do diets there of master plants, other plants that is not psychoactive. Plants that is going to heal the body if you are sick for any disease. All plants that is going to teach you. If you are not sick, the plants are going to teach you, you know, in, in higher state of consciousness. So I was very interested in anything. Just show me, teach me anything. But he will not tell me anything. He will tell me, give me a bottle, like a liter of this type of a concussion, these plants, and tell me, go to the depth of the gym, come out of, go out of the village, take this bottle, and stay when you find a little uh, roof because there is no walls, no, the, the hut is only a roof of leaves, you stay there until you finish. I was like, what? <laughs> he knew because he, he told me to go and to come out to there, from there only when I finish it. Usually when you finish this little of a concussion is a period of eight days. I, thought, I was there for one night and I ran for my life. <laughs> I ran for my life because all the fear for some reason, maybe because I was there already this eight month, maybe because my hope was already gone, maybe so many, so many reasons, no? But I go to the to the little hut that he tells me to go. And during the day it was fine. I went there at like in a in, in noon time. And during the day it was fine. I was very happy to be isolated in the in the jungle in, in this way. And the, the, the day beautiful and I can see all the plants and everything. It was like a dream, no? But when the night came, with the night came all my fears. But literally all my fears that I have accumulated from day one in my life in this incarnation into the very moment that I was standing in the jungle in the dark, pitch black, 40 minutes away from the village. And I cannot run, I cannot do anything. I can only experience all the fears. The fears uh, that came out from losing my mother, the fears of the sexual abuse, the physical, the physical uh, beating, all the fears, the fears of the, the hell because of the church period. All the fears at one time. And when I experienced this, I was crying for my life and shaking for my life. And I felt this is not for me. 
I don't want this. I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to see all these fears. I don't want to see all this because it's so intense. And I, the only thing that I could think is to run for my life. And I need to leave the jungle right now. I needed to the car to come right now to pick me up. So as soon as I was like 4 a.m. that the, the light start coming out, I literally ran from the little uh, hut to the village. And I got there crying, screaming, and dripping sweat. It's super hot in the jungle. And then I go there to my husband's house. He's waking up. He's still, what is going on? I'm like, I need to go home. <laughs> I need to go home and knock his door. And he come out and I'm crying. I'm telling him that I need to go home, that I'm very afraid. And I cannot have this experience. All this that is coming out to me is this that I want not to experience. I want to experience the opposite of this. And then there was things about devil and hell and things that, that show up. And then he, he just watch and look at me without saying one word. And I'm like, <laughs> and then he say, when I finish, he say, you came to finish your process of 15 days. When you're done, you can go home. But the way that he say was so father-like that I never experienced like an authority like this, but so straight to the point. He was not having none of this. You can cry all you wanted. You finish your process and then you go home. And I was, wow, so, you know, shocked, overwhelmed with this answer that I just say, yes. I say, okay. <laughs> And then I, I felt like a little girl that I needed to finish. Even if it was hard, I need to do it. And, and then also he said, there is no devil that is going to come and take you to hell. Just go back and finish your process. Okay, that, that, that maybe it's, it was good for me to hear there is no devil that's going to take me to hell because I had all these horror uh, uh, thoughts and, and, and things in my mind. Uh, but it didn't help to take the fear away. I needed literally to walk myself through the fear. And I, there was no way away from the fear. I need to walk inside of the fear through the whole eight days that I was isolated until I come out myself, come out of the fear. And once this happened, once I was going through the fear and through all this time, I was learning the reason of the fears, the roots of the fears, and all that was there to, to, for all of this to be possible inside of my consciousness. And when I come out you know, of these eight days, and I finished the bottle of medicine. And I knew that I had to be there for probably the rest of my life. Because at the time I thought, I'm not going back out of the world. I'm going to be here into I learn everything that I have to learn. And then I, I, would, I, was, I was, that was it. <laughs> I decided that we would stay. The first time that I stay, I stay for seven months and doing diets and go inside and revisiting those places. Mm -hmm. Like I said, you are the bravest person I know on this planet <laughs> because you did it and you went back and you stayed seven months. It's incredible. And you completely faced your fears. I don't know of anyone who's done that. Well done. Do you Thank still you prepare? So Thank you. Do you still prepare in the same way? Yeah, yeah. Now the fears are different now, no, because the fears doesn't go away. Actually, fear is a great material that we can use. Now I have a deeper, deeper fear that has to do with the beyond, the invisible, and the things that we cannot find information here in the in the matter. But I tell you, when the medicine is strong and is in, and presence it comes through, I also feel the same feeling that I want to run away because it's so big, it's so much big beyond of the beyond that. Naturally, the physicality, the human part of me is going to feel this way. But now I know this fear and I can stay in the fear and re even relax in it, even bring my presence. And because it's the physical, it's the human part of myself that I'm afraid. This part is, is only afraid because it doesn't understand, doesn't know what is it going on. But if I trust in the energy that is being open, I will understand in the end of my process that there's nothing to be fearful. There is absolutely nothing to be fearful. When we, we open to our greatness, it's fear that we encounter because we don't understand how great and great this greatness can be. No? And then some of us are, are stopped, are frozen by the fear, we stop, we don't continue. And some of us feel that like we're going to continue even though the fear is here. And that's what I chose to do, to continue even though feel, feeling fear, before I didn't understand the fear, didn't know the fear. Now I know and I can use it in my favor 
when the fear comes. So yes. Tiana, it sounds like you found an amazing teacher and shaman when you went down into the jungle and you were very lucky to have found the right person. I wanted to address the the um, the word shaman because I know you don't like um, using it in reference to yourself. Um, and, you know, despite you being exceptionally well-trained and having led um, plant medicine retreats all over the world for pretty much the last 10 years, you know, so, I mean, you're a plant medicine woman and you like to be referred to yourself as a guide, which is beautiful. Um, I wanted to hear your perspective about, you know, the word shaman and how it's used, because I feel like, you know, it, it's getting to the point where, you know, people do a weekend online course and then on Monday they're shaman and and no. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, thank you for that question too. It's such a great question. Uh, also, uh, such a, a important thing for us to understand. No? Everything is about educating ourselves. When we don't know, it's so easy for us to make mistakes and make errors. And I feel like our society, human society, as in, in, in general, no? there are so much space for learning there. We don't learn in none of the things that we use it in this concept growing up. We don't learn in the church. We don't learn in the school, let alone at home. So it's about education. And I am very uh, emphasized on this education with my clients. It's like for them to learn for themselves. What is it, this process? You know, Some of us are going to like you say, go for a weekend uh, workshop and come out Monday and, and be a shaman. Is it working? I, is a question of, is it working for society? Is it working for the communities? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no, no. In the end, everything is good. Everything, absolutely. Even the bad is good because it's taking us into the direction for us to learn what is important for us, right? So the shaman concept, in the jungle, we don't use this word shaman. Nobody knows this word. And when someone refer this word, say, oh, my, my teacher is, is the shaman, or call, or call the teacher the shaman, the shaman doesn't understand what this, this means. And when someone wanted to use the shaman word, usually has a connotation towards the ego part of the, the human, right? The, the, the shaman in the village is known by a curandero. Curandero is someone that heal himself, Curandero is someone that healed his family. And then Curandero inevitably, be, with those healing, is going to offer for the people also around the, in the village or whoever comes and asks, oh, you know what is good for my health. And Curandero is going to do that. A medicine person that is dedicated in the jungle, there is the Curandero that is going to do the prayer for someone. And there is the, the medicine woman that knows all the plants that is good for the health. Right? They not necessarily are the same person. Usually in some cultures, each person in the village has a, has a, a, a figure. No? Have a, 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 if someone is a, a plant master, the other person is the prayer master. If someone is the prayer master, the other one is the, actually the, med the, the poor medicine master, you see? So everybody has a, a place inside of the, this collective and nobody's just one thing. Like a, one man is all those things all together. Uh, of course, that does not, not limit the person to learn all about all the, those arts no? and become a more uh, uh, understood, a more wise person. But usually it's divided, it's divided like that. I like the word curandero because it emphasizes that for you to be a curandero for someone, you have to have healed yourself. Nobody that has not healed themselves. Okay? And, and also uh, uh, important to understand, understand here that we spend our whole life in healing. It's not like that we healed and then suddenly we are perfect and ready. Now we can go. No, we are healing our life through our whole life. But the main part of the, 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 the traumas and the suffering, the pain, we have to deal with this and transform this part into something beautiful. If you have done that in your life, you don't have to live in the in jungle or even serve ayahuasca to be a curandero. So many of us are curanderos in this, in, in this earth, you know, in this life. Look into our uh, grandmothers. Our grandmothers, many of them didn't drink ayahuasca, but they were all curanderos. They were all curanderos because they understood all of those levels you know, of intelligence, of this disease, of, of life. So then curandero is that person. 
the shaman is the shaman today that we understand and bring the mass and give it to the people is, is feeding an ego part of ourselves. If we healed ourselves or not, it doesn't matter. I am a shaman. If I heal the, the traumas with my family, it doesn't matter. I am a shaman. Is a, a shallow connotation, you know, of the work that is really being done. The elders, the ones that are serving medicine for a whole life since the day they will they will start walking, they don't call them anything. <laughs> if you ask them what they know, they will tell you, I know nothing. I know I nothing. And I really resonate, resonate with that uh, way of life because I, the same way that I feel. I feel more that I get to know, more that I inform in this mind, the less that I know. I know so little, and I can say I know nothing. I know nothing because the beyond, the information, the consciousness that is in the beyond, that is surround us, that is inside of us, that is everywhere, that make it this very existence, this very conversation, this very interaction possible. We don't know nothing about it, how it ended up to be in such a way. So I like to feel that, that way. I feel I have about this year is going to be 13 years that I'm doing this practice. I feel a little egg, you know, like it's just ratched out. Maybe it's broken. The, the, the shell it starts to ratch. <laughs> to ratch. <laughs> so I can pick outside because it's so big. It's so beyond us. It's so beyond the mind can actually grasp, you know. And I'm going to spend my whole entire life and I'm going to continue to be a student. I will never grow into be a full curandera because my life is spent. It's too short for me to uh, call myself into such a thing. But I am an apprentice. I am a study of a study, 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 uh, student of the plants, and I'm going to continue to do so until my heart is inspiring to do that. Tatiana, I wanted to speak about, you were talking about fear earlier right and you know as as beautiful as these experiences are and as profound as they are there are also sometimes you know potential risks and challenges that go with them and so you know I wanted to give people who are considering doing ayahuasca for the first time like a, a well-rounded view of you know what to expect as far as challenges that could arise during a ceremony and how people can prepare themselves for those Mm -hmm. The best preparation that we can do coming out of our house to go to a ceremony is fully trust into who you are. I know this is a tough one for some people. I, I understand that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. But you've got to have the, the trust in yourself. You've got to trust in yourself that you can hold yourself through anything because you can. Maybe you don't believe that. Maybe you didn't learn that. But I'm telling you that you can. Every single human being can trust in themselves to go through anything in this life, even sitting for six hours period in a session. No? And if we have to visit it, what well, well hurt the most in us, we can do that because we are that powerful. No? So the first thing coming out of your house is to be have that, that feeling of trust. Even if it's not natural for you, fall upon this feeling of trust that you can trust in your heart and then you can trust in yourself to hold whatever it comes out in this session, I'm going to be able to hold myself. There is the first step. The second step you already took care of is knowing who is bringing the medicine, trusting the person, not trusting the environment that the person is creating for you to do the journey. And then when you are in the journey and you are drinking the medicine and the fears start to come out naturally also because medicine is there for this very reason. It's going to show you where the fears are and why we are feeling those fears so we can understand that we can spend our, ourselves now we can spend the way that we live our lives so then i see people uh, drinking medicine for the first time sometimes they are so tight because they don't know no the mind doesn't know what is is going to come up uh, they're going to have a, a very disconnected breath for example right they they're going to breathe in such a way uh, they don't know how to breathe basically right so i'm going to bring attention into their breath first like when we start the session we're going to all breathe together and then when we finish a breath together we're going to do a, a, a short practice of a breath that we can utilize this why we are going in the journey why we are in the journey why we are with the effect of the medicine we're going to utilize this breath practice 
So it can ground us, it can bring us back into our body, it can help us to feel I can do this because I am here fully with myself. So the breath work is one step to come out of a state like that, the state that they're overwhelmed of, of a fear. No? Also, a state that there is overwhelmed of the medicine itself, that when it's cleansing the body, it can be overwhelmed too. We're also going to use the breath work. This is one of the greatest masters that one, one can have throughout the session because you can, you can calm down your body, you can calm down your mind by breathing such a way, and you can also expand your experience. You can make even deeper feeling the medicine when you breathe in such a way. So breath is very present and important, and I bring attention into it every time I sit with the group. Mm -hmm. And speaking of helpful, do you have any books that you could recommend or you know, documentaries to watch or something like that for people who are thinking of journeying or doing an ayahuasca ceremony for the first time? So for me, it is make more sense if you're going to drink a mask for the first time, don't watch another, don't watch anything, don't read about it. Just allow yourself to have the experience. Have, make sure that those things that we talked before is in place. Like we have to trust the person, trust the environment, trust what this experience and just trust yourself to don't really know yet, you know, don't bring the material yet to your mind before you have the experience because you're going to use those materials when you're having the experience. Oh, maybe it's going to be like this. Maybe it's going to be like that. But I, I read that and I read that. It's not that this is not happen. So it, it sometimes creates more problem than it, 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 it resolves, right? When we are afraid or uh, unsure. So trust that inside of yourself, you have the tools inside of your mind and your heart. You just have to work on trusting this. It's there. Is there? Is everybody have it? You will have it too. So trust this. Go. Don't read it too much. Take care of the the the, the diet. Take care of the emotion, the psychology, also the silence. Take care of that and go with your heart. Go because you can do it. Go because you have the strength. Go because you are it. It's just a recognition. No? We forget that we are it, and then we go and we have those experiences, and we, we we understand that ah yes, it's not different than what I am. So trust in that. And then after, when you have the experience yourself, having the experience for the first time, of course, educate yourself because education is everything. But you already have a reference of your experience that you, you have it, you had it yourself. Now you can read about what other people say. That is such excellent advice and suggestions because exactly what you're saying, I feel like you know, a lot of reading up front creates all sorts of expectations and then circles back to that, that what we were talking about before of wanting to control the experience, you know, and have it be like what you read in the book. And really, and uh, you know, and ex experiences like these, I don't think any book can explain to you because it's a, it's felt, you know, from the very core of your being and in every cell of your body. And yeah, I absolutely agree with you to then, you know, do a lot of reading and learning and understanding afterwards because it's a fascinating topic. Yes. 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 What is your message to the world around plant medicine and even more importantly, traditional knowledge? <laughs> wow. You know, early in my experience, I had these uh, desires in my heart and even like I had dreams about the whole world, drinking, sitting and drinking medicine. Today I understand that medicine is not for everyone and it's not everybody that needs medicine either. But I do have a wish in my heart that we can all as humankind open our minds and our heart for psychedelics and for practice that takes us deeper inside. It doesn't have to be an unalterated state of our conscious. You can go and, and start doing a yoga practice and take that practice for your whole life. You can do a, a practice of a meditation and do that, take that for your whole life. Practice, let us, we all as human beings choose, take the responsibility to choose practice that is going to take us towards the spiritual part of us, the unseen part of us, that we do not take time enough to do that. So even if you, I cannot afford my family is too big and I don't have time, I don't have time to put the food in the table. Every time you go to your bed, you can pray for the universe. You can pray with, sorry, you can pray with your heart open to what is bigger than us, right? We can all include a small practice or bigger practice into our life so we can 
integrate the part, the spiritual part that we are. We cannot continue negate, continue negating that this spiritual part that we are is going to continue to give us the same result that we are seeing in the society. We have to find ways in our life. We have to find ways and time in our life to incorporate the practice of spirituality and not only material practice. We don't only need to do work, eat, go to bed and have a successful full job. They are, they are much more beyond that what we are in this world, what we are as human beings, so much more beyond. And when we don't look into those, this beyond part of us, we're going to get sick. Inevitably, we're going to get sick. There is no other way because only when we get sick, then we can understand, go back and say, why understand and learn that I am not just the physical. Unfortunately, there is sickness in the world, like things like a cancer, like things like a, 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 things big like this, that can transform someone's life day to night. Tonight, today we are having great life. Tomorrow we discover that we have cancer. Life is very different, but we can avoid those experiences. I'm saying as, a, as an example here, but we can avoid to have experiences like that by integrating, because when our body is free, like we say before in the interview, is a, is a little bit late for the body because the body is already sick, you know? But from that stream, from that place where the body is already sick, we can then go back, you know, go back and start to learning the reasons why the body is sick. And this process of learning why the sickness is there in the first place is going to take us where? Back into the spiritual part of ourselves. For the sickness then becomes an invitation. When Buddha said that there was no, there was only the suffering in the world, you know? And there is only suffer, but at the same time, there is no suffer. It's the way that we look into the suffering in the world, in the world and also the suffering in our lives. Because the suffer can be an invitation. The sickness can be an invitation for us to be more aware and bring more consciousness into our life, into all the lives that there is around us. So it's all positive. Doesn't matter how much struggle, doesn't matter how much pain, it's all positive and is all an a, a, a invitation of the great spirit itself to bring us closer to home, you know, that we've been going away for so long. I would like to thank you for this experience, speaking of experiences, and it's, um, you know, these these conversations are always such a gift to me because, you know, despite us knowing, knowing each other for 10 years, I, I feel like every time we see each other, you know, if it's in Miami or Brazil or wherever it is, that there's always other people around or it's fragmented yeah. little pieces of conversation. And so it, it's been such a gift for me to spend this hour with you. I feel like I've learned so much about you that I didn't know before. I didn't know the story of your parents. I am supremely grateful that you did not die young and that you are here with us today. <laughs> I am so grateful for the transformational work that you do in the world um, with everyone around you and all over the world. And, you know, like I said, you are by far the bravest person, you know, not only because you went into the jungle, but also because you're one of the few people who I've met who has had 200% courage to fully, fully follow your path, um, you know, and, and I, I think that's incredible. And I feel like this listening to you for an hour, like all your knowledge and your insights that you've gained over these years and all these experiences provide so much, um, I, I would say, comfort and love. And so I wanted to thank you for that. And thank you for being here with me. It's been an absolute gift. Mm. I feel the one that I gifted <laughs> by you too. You bring so much too. And I feel a sense of security. You know, I always felt that way with, with you around. You bring so much wisdom. You bring so much memory from before. And even without saying words, there are so much exchange that you bring into my uh, presence that I'm really grateful grateful for, for the force that you are as a human into the world and the things that you bring into people's life no stoppable it's like the the pure divine incarnated embodied the intentionality the direction 
part of that. So I am, I am the gifted one. And I also thank you, you for putting these projects together and inviting me. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> because I am not so good with it, this type of thing. So I'm so grateful that you thought of, of me and that you, you invited me and then may we continue the conversation. I also have fun uh, answering those questions. Absolutely, thank you so much. And what I also wanted to say, as, as you said, is I, I feel like this is just the start of the conversation. Um, Tatiana and I have decided that we want to cover other topics like how to integrate plant medicine ceremonies. We'd also like to cover, you know, her own personal journey into the jungle. And there's also another part of this is that Tatiana has a wonderful partner, Charles, who also does uh, medicine work and is also a guide, but who specializes in um, addictions, um, help using plant medicines to help with addictions. He is wanting to do an incredible interview around shame and guilt, which I think is hugely important in this world. And the best part of this is that they are busy putting together a documentary and so I highly, highly encourage you, if you've enjoyed this content and you've enjoyed being with myself and Tatiana, please feel free to subscribe, comment, share this video. And we will be putting the link for Tatiana's documentary in the comments below. Also, if you have questions for her or if you'd like to reach out to her, please again, put it in the comments below. I'm sure she'd love to answer your questions. As you've seen, she's a wealth of information. And yes, feel free to connect. And we're looking forward to the next discussions. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you so much. <laughs>